Path of Totality by David Schaffman. The unexamined life is not worth drawing. My brain feels gummy. I don't know if that's an actual condition, but the feeling that the process of cognition is somehow impeded by a sticky, gooey substance seems as close as I can get to describing how I think or how I try to think since I never really feel fully lucid. I wish my head was like a clear, quiet lake where I could visualize my thoughts with beautiful and peaceful coherence. I imagine other people might be capable of this. In my gummy brain, I think of people like this as being smart. By this I mean not necessarily people who can speak in fully formed paragraphs. I can do that fairly easily. It's more, I'm thinking of those folks who have the ability to be both analytical and poetic at the same time. But there is a legitimate place for gummed up thinking. There is a place where gummed up thinking may even be a virtue. I know this because intuitively I feel a kinship for those thinkers that are constantly punching above their weight. There's even a name for that type of thinker. They're called artists. Reading has always been difficult for me. That's why I do a lot of it. I read between 35 and 50 books a year. Not that impressive for an intellectual, but pretty damn good for a dyslexic. I, I definitely don't read for pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm something of a failed hedonist and pleasure never really held much purchase on my imagination. I have several motives for reading. One is a response to the intellectual inferiority I carry with me like a rucksack. Like most auto autodidacts, I'm chronically insecure about my intelligence. Every act of scholarship is an act of impersonation. Pop psychologists and self-help, quote, thought leaders call this with their typical artless arrogance, the imposter syndrome. As with most things, these tiresome pundits of paraphrase get nowhere close to describing real feelings of inadequacy. If someone feels like an imposter, they're probably justified. I don't feel like a faker. I feel like someone trying to arrive at some kind of cogent state of understanding but constantly falling short. I fall short because my brain is full of gum. In other words, I'm a visual artist and when it comes to images or pictures, I think extremely clearly. And yet, I try. I think we can all agree that reading Proust is a decent gauge of one's intellectual stamina. Now, several times in my life, starting in college, I've attempted reading in search of lost time. But like most people, I never got past Swan's Way. I, I must have partially read Swan's Way at least half a dozen times. Each time it was a chore, but each time it got easier. Not only did it get easier, and I don't want this to sound like I think Proust is literature's equivalent to Kale, but with each successive attempt, the pleasure quotient, wait, didn't I just disavow pleasure as a motive? Anyway, the pleasure motive or the pleasure quotient increased. On the surface, the story is completely unrelatable. What do I know or care about the social hierarchies of Third Republic France? But like Twain's quip about Wagner's music being better than it sounds, Proust's prose, his patience, his eye for physical description and psychological insight is a lot better than his story. Or at least that's how my glutinous brain sees it. But I won't deny that he also puts me to sleep. 
page-long sentences with all manner of digressive clauses are not particularly friendly to my learning disabilities. I probably shouldn't read him in bed, but I do have to say, not only does he neatly knit up my raveled sleeve of care, but he reliably provides me with deep introspective dreams that tenderly revisit my past. I'm either a creature or a victim of habit. Samuel Beckett described habit as the ballast that chains the dog to his vomit. Now, I wouldn't go that far, but daily ritual seems like a stable, albeit predictable point of departure for any human trying to navigate the complexities of living. For an artist, habit is indispensable. Banker's hours is how Mark Rothko described his schedule in his studio. The romantic image of the artist impulsively responding to the urgency of inspiration is a lovely Hollywood myth, but the truth is that in order to be productive, an artist must have an unwavering discipline. My day starts as it has ever since I was in the seventh grade with the New York Times. Mrs. Sibner had all her students subscribed to the Times and had it delivered every morning to our classroom. The first thing we learned was the courtesy fold. This was a fail-safe method for turning the pages of an unwieldy newspaper while sitting in a crowded subway or bus. Now, it's important to remember that in 1970, the total width of the paper, when fully extended, was five inches wider than it is today. So learning how to leaf through it while keeping your elbows glued to your ribcage was not only courteous, but potentially life preserving. Now, I didn't do this then, but as I get older, I find myself prioritizing the crossword puzzle. My reasoning and my memory are pasty enough as it is. So if I train my brain to make clever conceptual associations, I figure I can delay more serious age-related neurological impairment. I'm not sure if the science behind this is solid, but since I read about it in the Times, there must be some truth to it. Living in Los Angeles and suffering the misfortune of having to earn a living, most mornings I have to get in my car and drive to work. My gold 1993 two-door Jeep Cherokee was a gift from my friend Jeff, who is something of a big shot in the show business ecosystem. He bought the car used when he was still struggling to get people to return his calls. The car had less than 15,000 miles on it. He now collects cars. And me, I'm fortunate to get 16 miles per gallon. Years ago, someone stole my antenna. This was not uncommon. Venice, California, where I lived at the time, was still dominated by working class families, artists, bodybuilders, and gangbangers. The local drug addicts would use the hollow antennae to smoke crack. FM reception has been spotty ever since, and as a result, I spend most of my time driving in silence. It's become a habit. So even when I borrow my wife's more respectable car, I keep the radio off and allow my mind to wander. I've grown to appreciate the hideous beauty of the streets and freeways of LA. I'm not one of those people who relies on navigational apps. To be honest, I've only used them once or twice. I prefer to invite the serendipitous anarchy of an automotive flaneur. Somehow, Unlike your typical Angelino, I never arrive late. When I drive to work, depending on the time and the weather, I have my Guermont way and I have my Mésiglise way and any, any number of other routes that suit the particular conditions. 
I'm not sure anyone would accuse the intersection of Slauson and La Brea of resembling the byways of Combray, but for me, the gas stations and the strip malls evoke an unlikely sense of nostalgia. Now, this is strange because there is nothing even remotely similar between Ladera Heights and my childhood neighborhood in Brooklyn. Maybe it's their radical dissimilarities that stir my memory. It's that melancholy sense of, how did I get here, that accounts for these frequent daydreams into my past. My Brooklyn of the 1960s was a provincial haven of Jewish families recovering from the traumas of history. We were taught to love Israel and never to forget the Holocaust. We were normal, but different. We loved rock and roll, but we also loved dancing in the street on Simchat Torah, singing infectious anthems about hastening the coming of the Messiah. We were innocent in our love. The Jews were special. The Goyim were dangerous. Israel was strong. And for the moment, at least, America was good to us. I was 17 when I met my first Protestant. It's in the car, in traffic, where I weigh the implications of my history. Or maybe weighs too strong of a word. In many ways, Los Angeles is the perfect place to process one's past. Nothing is terribly new here, so the spell of the Madeleine is probably weaker. A traffic jam, you might say, is like ton perdu light. Besides, it's not physical places that move me as much as the indelible faces of the people who were close to me. After half a million red lights, I've really litigated the past into many competing versions. I've attempted to condense them here. And at the very worst, you can enjoy the illustrations. My father, who was quiet and measured, presided over our family while deferring to my mother with uxorious devotion. Unlike the teachers at my Orthodox yeshiva, he was neither strident nor judgmental. He was as devout as one would expect a rational man to be after seeing millions of Jews and many members of his family murdered by the Nazis. If he believed in God, he did so with a grudge. I think of my father every day, even when I'm not driving through traffic. He taught us to be uncompromisingly ethical, though he never sufficiently warned us of the price this sort of probity exacts. Outside of Chagall, Modigliani, and Soutine, he knew next to nothing about art. When I told him of my plans to study painting in art school, he urged me to become an architect instead. Though he never insisted, that was never his way. His generosity was too capacious. His love for his children was too unconditional to ever attempt to tamper with our aspirations. When I think of my father, he is always in his 60s. He was 44 when I was born, and in those days that was considered old. I always wonder what he would make of me now, now that I've reached that age, his age, the age where I first became conscious of my father as a man, and not only as a parent. I especially think about this when I drive to work. See. I was supposed to become a famous painter. That was my plan. All I needed to do was to rent a studio, make beautiful and unusual paintings, behave ethically, remain patient and forthright, and success would follow me like a dog on a leash. <laughs> In an odd way, I still entertain this ridiculous fantasy. Of course, the world does not always cooperate with dreams. And as Yates pointed out, in dreams begin responsibilities. My problem was that I always separated the two. Responsibility meant taking care of myself and my family. Dreaming was done in the studio every day during banker's hours. This 
Bifurcation resulted in an impractical accommodation. While I spent my time in the studio with impeccable diligence, I always pursued the path of least resistance when it came to responsible, gainful employment. And so I teach. I teach drawing, I teach life drawing, I teach painting, but my teaching jobs are completely unfulfilling and poorly paid. This is entirely my fault. Never intending to become a teacher and having assumed that I would live off of my prodigious talents as an artist, I neglected preparing strategically for a respectable job. In my early 30s, in an uncharacteristic spasm of practical thinking, I applied and was accepted to several prestigious MFA programs. Looking at the cost, through the prism of my arrogance, I blew the whole enterprise off. It, it never occurred to me that I was only adding one more impediment to my incipient adulthood. I mainly teach high school students. I've been doing it for nearly 30 years. I've received volumes of heartfelt notes of appreciation, citing my profound influence and inspiring erudition. Dewy-eyed parents offer me their limp, clammy hands, clasping mine as they express their gratitude. You see, an art career is feared by most of these parents, seeing it as a futile exercise in class mobility downward, but having given up on their offspring's academic prospects, they see art as a desperate consolation. Administrators shower me with praise, though remain stingy with their purse. If my ego were invested in my pedagogy, all this might alleviate my bitterness, but instead, it just leaves me cold. It leaves me frustrated. The best that could be said for all this thankless toil is that it has kept my draftsman skills sharp. I'm not naturally talented, far from it. My early apprenticeship did little to help me overcome my deficiencies. Having attended art school in the 1970s, most of my professors were mired by either the awesome shadow of expressionism or the Spartan idealism of the minimalists. They soft-pedaled the rudiments of rendering from life, either out of ideology or incompetence. Years after earning my undergraduate degree, I found myself struggling to master the most basic tools of drawing from observation. Now, if art school teaches anything, it's the survival skills and instincts essential for compensating for a doleful lack of employable skills. Like many of my peers, I learned how to hang sheetrock, how to paint a house, and how to use power tools. But lacking the physical and mathematical dexterity to translate those schools into a reliable paycheck, I chose to drive a cab. So, while my more mature colleagues dispersed to collect advanced degrees, I sat behind the wheel of a bright yellow Ford Crown Victoria, getting dangerously intimate with what is sometimes called the real world. I'm not complaining. Driving is an important skill and I'm very, very good at it. I probably drive better than I draw. And in Los Angeles, what skill could be more useful? I don't claim to love Los Angeles, but I certainly don't hate it. As, as my brother, who lived in LA for 10 years as a middling, overeducated screenwriter explained, you can't survive and appreciate this city without a keen sense of irony. Architecturally, though we're not Paris, we're also not Pyongyang. Without the inspired planning of a Georges Eugène Haussmann or the megalomaniacal urban fantasies of the Kim dynasty, LA was left to itself to develop an aesthetic based on dreams, money, and untutored individual discretion. It, it's like a dog's breakfast of stylistic promiscuity, making us the perfect iteration of postmodernism. Now, nothing illustrates this idea more eloquently than the ridiculous ubiquity of palm trees. These 
towering trees that sway in the breeze like hippies at a rave are our answer to the Mansard roof. I like these trees. I love these trees. I love everything about them. I even love their broken brown fronds when they litter the streets after every storm. All of our arch architectural misdemeanors are for forgiven and even embraced by the comic governance of the palms. The palms are everywhere. They preside like benevolent monarchs. They're alternating cool to warm greens and rusty umbers play off our relentless blue skies. It reminds me of the painterly harmonics of Bonnard, Corot, and Fairfield Porter. If you like grays and reds, and I do, go to New York. But if you are nourished by the more flagrant palettes, as I am, where measured dissonances provide the frisson of chromatic chaos, come to LA, baby. Whether in clusters or alone, orphaned among the single-storied blandness of our wide tactical boulevards, the foreign palm asserts its quiet authority in silence. This is the unsung bomb to the onus of driving. It gives me a wacky sense of peace and the permission to invent. Which is what I really do for a living. The, do the job description of an artist is someone who has granted themselves permission to make things and to make things up. An artist is, in the words of the Chilean poet Vicente Widobro, un pequeño dios, a little god. And being god can't be a sideline. You have to commit, and this type of commitment is a form of madness. The idea of making something so completely superfluous and claiming it as something urgently necessary is an errand for dreamers. At least God has a physical ecosystem backing her up. All we have are galleries, collectors, curators, and teaching jobs. You have to go to the studio every day. Honestly, I never want to go to the studio. I'd rather sit with the New York Times all morning, drinking coffee and noshing on bagels and sponge cake. I'd rather ride my bicycle along the beach. I'd rather meet up with friends for lunch. I'd rather read Proust. I'd rather catch a matinee at the local art house cinema. I'd rather nap. I'd rather cook meals that required more than one or two or three ingredients that don't include pasta. I'd rather methodically exercise and flatten my turgid dad gut. I'd rather pursue some version of happiness instead of hiding behind an obscure ideal of creative eudaimonia. But I can't. Like I said, like I said, it's a form of madness. Oh yes, there, there are days there are days when you feel inspired. There are days when every pore of your body is harmonized with a chorus of angels and you are one with the universe. But those days are rare and get rarer as you age. Art is about ideas and the older and smarter one gets, the more complex and subtle one's work should become. If you're honest, diligent, and keenly introspective, your work will grow. If you're lazy or complacent, your work will descend into a decadent mannerism. Now, art isn't a career. Careers are measured by stature and achievement. Being an artist is like being, is like being left-handed or red-headed or, or clinically depressed or hammer-toed. You have no choice, and it sometimes feels like an affliction. Now, if this sounds romantic, I can assure you that's not my intention. Being a god, or more precisely, competing with god, is serious business and not even remotely fun. Even though the weather in Southern California is comically idyllic, I love the idea of squandering this paradise in favor of pacing my converted garage and turning my obsessions into objects. Take this book. When I made it, you were the last thing from my mind. It was compulsion that drove me to make it, not communication. 
When, when Hemingway was asked what messages he hoped to convey in his stories, he shot back that if he had messages, he would have gone to Western Union. Now, all this is to say that though I recognize the futility of art, I insist that it is with our art that we measure our civilization. Nobody remembers Michelangelo's dentist. The tools I prefer are the most primitive, not because I have a righteous deference for tradition, but because working with the simple basic elements like paint, paper, pencils, canvas, and wood keeps me independent. I don't need collaborators or technology or expensive machines. To me, living as an artist is the greatest expression of personal agency, and I feel most free when I'm all alone making stuff with my hands. Appropriately, the following section will describe my work, which will be the longest and perhaps the most boring part of the book. Nothing, nothing I can assure you will happen. Here it's like watching paint dry, and that's not a metaphor. One idea that has occupied me quite a bit in the last few years is the artist's book. I like it precisely because you can't hang it on a wall. I love painting. I love making paintings. I love to look at good paintings. I'm, I'm grateful that such a thing as painting exists in this world. I have traveled extensively in order to study paintings. To that end, I've visited hundreds of churches, cathedrals, and museums around the world. I especially love, love paintings that are elegantly drawn and impeccably composed. Seeing something like Tintoretto's crucifixion at Scuola San Rocco in Venice or Ingres' portrait of Monsieur Bertin at the Louvre is like experiencing perfection. Works like these are timeless because in addition to being beautifully made, they are eccentric and uncanny. They are impeccable yet personal, geometric yet liquid, remote yet oddly touching. Works like these transcend subject matter in favor of the ineffable, ineffable seductions of form. Like a great poem, the rewards deepen upon repeated interactions. Yet, as objects, they're sanctified. And why shouldn't they be? We, the public, have every right to admire these works and be moved by them. But what about contemporary paintings hung on crisp, white walls evenly illuminated by carefully calibrated spotlights and decorously spaced like merchandise at an exclusive boutique? I don't know about you, but I couldn't afford to buy a painting. I don't care what the artist's intentions were. I don't care how challenging or how prescient or timely or disruptive or discursive or politically insightful the picture is. I don't care how the critics describe it or how earnest and thoughtful the accompanying wall label is. At the end of the day, the picture I see on the wall in front of me is not a provocation. It's a, it's a commodity. And more than that, more than a commodity, it's a luxury item. Well, sure, of course, hasn't it always been like this? Hasn't art always relied on patronage? Patronage, shouldn't an artist be able to make a living? Yes, without a doubt, but we're getting off the topic. It's not about painting, it's about me and why I like to make artist books. Artist books are relatively small, at least, at least mine are. They are intimate, they can be extremely idiosyncratic without descending into hermetic incoherence. As three-dimensional objects, they have the added advantage of behaving like sculpture as well. They involve artisanship, yet they are forgiven their imperfections. Implicit in their form is the literary tradition, which is arguably more durable and arguably more accessible. But I think what draws me the most about the book form is that it can't be domesticated. A painting, no matter how poignant or how disturbing, 
Once it's hung on a wall, it becomes tranquilized into an ornament. This is especially true when it's installed above the proverbial couch. Like a predatory lion lounging in a zoo, there is something pathetic about a painting in an art fair attempting to stir our conscience. Don't get me wrong, I've spent decades painting pictures, beautiful pictures, earnest pictures, maybe even a few profound pictures. Some would argue, myself among them, that my hundred panel polyptic, The Body is His Book, is an artistic success. Through its irrational obsession with detail and its ironic interrogation of the aesthetics of repetition, it goes pretty far in recontextualizing the nature of religious iconography. But at the end of the day, where do you place a work like that? I would have to build a sanctuary or a chapel, Pache, Mark Rothko. And here again, we meet up with the impasse of accessibility. So while I wait for the opportunity to build a dedicated sanctum sanctorum, I prefer to make books. But don't get me wrong, I, I can't help myself. I still, I still prepare expansive surfaces and cover them with pigment. I still grapple with the limitations and possibilities of conventional picture making. I haven't entirely given up on painting's power to delight and illuminate. I will never deny myself the palpable ecstasy of conjuring imagery while defying the physical flatness of a piece of paper or, or a canvas or a, or a panel of wood. I even draw from the model and it is here where my helpless diffidence finds its fullest expression. Lacking talent, my decision to become a visual artist was in many ways an accident. I attended a prestigious art school where, as I described earlier, traditional skills, though far from discredited, were not exactly emphasized. Chronically insecure in my natural abilities, I managed to earn my degree while avoiding most of the demanding traditional courses. It didn't help that I was infatuated with the New York school of the 1950s. It gave me license to muffle my clumsiness under the holy dispensation of Pollock, de Kooning, and Klein. And so the studio is a crowded, well-ordered laboratory of overlapping projects. I have exchanged my previously sectarian view of what good art should be for an equally partisan form of aesthetic promiscuity. Age hasn't softened my stridency, it has merely fermented it. I've settled into a ragu of derivative manifestos. I'm with Harold Bloom when he defines the canon as art that was strange when it was conceived and remains strange throughout time. I'm with Eugenio Montale, who insisted on art having a second life by being rich and complex enough to sustain and reward multiple encounters. And I'm with André Breton, who proclaimed with his typical Bolshevik intolerance that beauty will be convulsive, or not at all. I've been blessed with a life practically free of dramatic incident, but that doesn't deny me an origin story. Mine began in New York City in the 1950s and 60s. At the time, with about two million, New York had the largest Jewish population in the world. Just to put that into context, today's Jewish population in Jerusalem is just over half a million. And to put that in even greater and more poignant context, Warsaw in 1939 had over three million Jews. Put another way, in our parents' eyes, we were the embers of a civilization that had almost gone extinct. The Western world was still biting its lip, chastened by the consequences of its bigotry and indifference. Traditional anti-Semitism was on hiatus at the time arguably making the Jews of New York the most fortunate Jews in Jewish history. The Midwood section of Brooklyn was like a province set apart by its suburban design, private 
and two family homes on the numbered streets, mid-sized apartment buildings on the avenues. My grandparents lived upstairs from us. Aunts, uncles, and cousins, if not within walking distance, were scattered throughout the city. In our world, visual art was marginal. After all, we were the people of the book. When I discovered the Brooklyn Museum, my whole world changed. At the time, Brooklyn was a series of ethnic and racial cantons. Though only a short subway ride away, as a 15-year-old yeshiva boy, the museum was in a different galaxy. This type of epiphanic coming of age is an old story and mine is not particularly dramatic. Now, it was at the museum's legendary art school. You know, Max Beckman had briefly taught there. It was at the art school where I took my first classes in life drawing and in painting. And it wasn't long before I exchanged my Talmud for a pocket full of subway tokens. I developed the habit of skipping school and roaming the streets of Manhattan. By the time I was 17, I had memorized the floor plan of the Museum of Modern Art. With my eyes closed, I could have navigated the galleries from Cezanne to Barnett Newman without bumping up against a single bench or pedestal. I, I barely understood what I was seeing, but I was dazzled by what I sensed was an abiding spirit of freedom. The Met was grand, but infinitely more perplexing. The sight of so many pictures of Jesus might have put me off at first. I was too young and too sheltered to fit Catholic imagery into my list of affinities. The Dutch, the Dutch were too dark and the French Rococo mm, looked like cotton candy. So I tended to skip about 500 years of art history. Now the Impressionists were of course a different story. It looked like something, it looked like something I could do. I, I could go outside and prop a canvas across a park bench and spread around gobs of paint like cream cheese on a piece of toast. I, I could try to capture light. I could use bright colors. My skills were lagging far behind my attitude, but I was too dumb to be frustrated. I painted and drew all the time, and this inevitably set me apart. Unlike my family and my friends at school, I was an artist. It's funny to think today about my smug sense of superiority. I was too cool for Brooklyn. Brooklyn was suffocating. All I ever dreamed of was leaving Brooklyn and never coming back. Today, today, of course, Brooklyn is the hippest burg in the East. I went off to college in 1974 and that set into motion a series of peregrinations that lasted about 20 years. After a stint in Europe and flipping coasts from the Bay Area to Manhattan, I finally settled in Los Angeles at the end of the millennium. In the meantime, my brothers and my parents abandoned New York and moved to Israel. That left me geographically unaccountable, and so I granted myself permission to perform a pantomime of reinvention. <laughs> Alas, as one ages, one sees the futility of imagining the self as a product of complete volition. As my mother used to always say, wherever you go, you take yourself with you. I'm the one on the left. My brothers were tremendous achievers, brilliant, wise, articulate, generous, and loving. Like I said, there's little dramatic tension in this story. We didn't fight over the toaster oven or the 6,000 books our parents left behind. It was never a feud. Our spouses are a sorority of genuine kinship and mutual support. Our kids, our kids not only follow each other on Instagram, but are actual physical friends. Now there's always loss, that's life. The guy on the right, the oldest of the three, is gone. At 73, he finally succumbed to a 30-year holy war with cancer. The one in the middle, despite our dotage, never stops reminding me that I'm his baby brother. Now, I don't think I believe in God, but I do believe in deities. Our parents were perfect beings, full stop. 
no commentary, no footnotes. But this guy, above all, who because of and despite all his efforts is responsible for making what little there is of me today. I know that he appeared earlier in the book, but Abba, who abhorred idolatry, must be central to this story. Abba was not a schmoozer. He was impatient with pretenders. He was indifferent to rank, to status, or to superficial professional accomplishment. He was a college professor. He didn't publish. He almost never lectured outside his classroom, and he never participated in conferences or panels or committees. But he was always the smartest guy in the room. It wasn't necessary for him to prove that to anyone. He would have been utterly baffled by social media. He, he never boasted, nor did he ever indulge in any form of academic resentments. If any of his colleagues wanted to pick a fight, Abba was the wrong foil. He effortlessly maintained and manifested an aura of high principle and dignity. He carried the supreme confidence of someone fully comfortable in their skin. When he spoke, he was always thoughtful and I never heard him speak about himself. He was a scholar with an incredibly prodigious memory, but he never flaunted his intelligence or used it to intimidate people. He was a genius and he was kind and he was loving and he was the perfect father. And I could never, even if I lived a thousand lifetimes, come close to his sublime nature. But for all his erudition, Abba never really got the artist thing. On his deathbed, he told me I should buy a suit. I didn't. <laughs>